my guest is Dr. Michael Heiser. He holds a PhD in Hebrew Bible and Semitic languages from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Before that, he earned an MA in ancient history from the University of Pennsylvania. Major fields were ancient Israel and Egyptology. Another MA from the University of Wisconsin, Madison in Hebrew studies. Attended Dallas Theological Seminary. And he is the academic editor for Logo Software. We partner together with Logo Software in many different ways here in the line of fire. And because of his cost work, Mike can do translation work in rough, roughly a dozen ancient languages among them Biblical Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Egyptian, Hieroglyphs, Ugaritic, Cuneiform. He's also studied Akkadian and Sumerian. Oh, and he's got some fascinating insights on the paranormal. Uh, Mike, thanks, thanks so much for joining us on the broadcast today. Thanks for having me, Mike. Um, we both earned PhDs in similar fields, and we both studied in secular universities. Michael, just, just take a moment to tell us how it is that, that you got interested in this journey as a follower of Jesus, and then we come back, we're going to start to explore this ancient world together. Well, I, I didn't have any sort of uh, spiritual upbringing. Uh, I, I didn't have the sort of you know circumstances that you describe in your testimony. I was I was much more boring. <laughs> you know, it, I was the, the the good kid, and you know, we just sort of did what you know normal families do, and didn't go to church or anything like that. But you know, there were times that people would in our in my family would talk about spiritual things but there was nothing serious and it was actually through a a single mom and one of her kids uh, she had four kids single mom you know pretty pretty tough situation but it was through their oldest uh, I became friends with him that I was put into circumstances where I heard the gospel for the first time and became a believer and and, and I was I was always interested in anything I tell sort you what, I'm, I'm just going to cut you off right there. We'll find out about the interest and how it got him into the ancient Near Eastern world. My guest, biblical and Semitic scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser, who is the academic editor for Logos Software, 866-348-7884. Uh, Michael, how old was it when you, you came to faith? Well, I was a teenager. Um, I would say my sophomore year, again, is my first recollection of really understanding the gospel. This particular friend I alluded to introduced me to it earlier, but it was really as a teenager, and again, it wasn't anything spectacular. I've, I hadn't done anything really awful. I just knew that, you know, I didn't, uh, there was a God, He was. there was a creator. I didn't create myself. I knew I had offended God in in, in some way, didn't really even have a total grasp of that, but I knew I knew my place, let's just put it that way, and again, came to grasp you know, the significance of what happened on the cross, and I had heard about Jesus before, but never really understood it, never really had it explained. And so I, I became a believer, and I had always, as just a you know, person, just a guy in general, been interested in anything sort of old and weird, uh-huh. and, and it, it sort of oriented me a little bit. I, I was really dramatically ignorant of, of anything spiritual. I'll give you an example. I, I can remember the day, I can remember where I was when I learned that people who taught the Bible, pastors and what and whatnot, actually got paid for that. I had no idea, <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, you know, I always wanted to be sort of a crusty old professor doing all this old and weird stuff. And, you know, if I could, if I could teach the Bible and, and actually have that be a job, that would be amazing. And, and it was just little things like that. I mean, it, it, I was really dramatically out of the loop, and, and there were just a variety of circumstances that sort of took that natural inclination and married it to, to Scripture. And it's it just been a lifelong fascination, and one thing has led to another. I went into Old Testament and Semitics because I thought that was where most of the problems were. Uh, my, my attitude was I wanted to go every place I went to it for a degree or for any kind of education. I wanted to be harder, and I wanted it to be more antagonistic. Because uh-huh. my attitude was, give me, give me what you got, give me your best shot. And at the end of the day, I just believed that none of these thoughts are new. They've all been thought before. People with a high regard for Scripture have encountered these before and, and tried to honestly deal with them. And God will lead me 
to resources and, and to good thinking and to people that can help guide me, and we'll just let the chips fall where they may. And that's sort of a really broad, sweeping overview of why I'm here and why I yeah. do what I do. You know, it's interesting, again, a, a, a parallel route, but a little different track for me. I started studying Hebrew because I was challenged by the rabbis, and I only went to college because I was honoring my parents that wanted me to go. But once I was there, I was kind of thrown in the lion's den immediately with a very skeptical Old Testament Semitic scholar who didn't seem to like the fact he was teaching undergraduate classes at a college, <laughs> kind of despised us, but just mocked everything. And I thought, wow, there got to be answers. And I had always sat with the rabbis in the same attitude. Hit me with your best shot. I'm confident of the truth of God, the truth of Scripture. And, and then as studies went on, it was the same attitude, right? Let's dig in. Let's face this thing head on. And the best, the best thing to do is to be able to read the original sources because someone's going to tell me your translation's lousy or uh, that dictionary made a mistake. So what do you do? You have to learn the languages. So it, it's quite an amazing journey. The one thing you got to do that I didn't get to do, I, I started a class in hieroglyphics while I was working on my doctoral dissertation and thought, I, mm -hmm. I just don't have time for this. But you actually got into hieroglyphics too. So the, the pyramid type inscriptions, how much time did you spend in that? Well, I had a year at Penn and then I, I picked up sort of a year. For me, it was sort of a year review uh, at Wisconsin. So I I, I can loosely say I've had two years of Egyptian. I, I mean, I've read through, you know, grammars and things like that, you know, just to sort of do it and kind of keep your head in it. But I've had two years. I, I never got into any book studies or anything like that. So it's, you know, again, you get your, your vocabulary and your grammar and you can you can follow along in a journal article, you know, what they're talking about when they talk about points of grammar and things like that. That that was what I wanted out of it. All right. So you you wrote your dissertation on the Divine Council. We're, we're going to get into something, friends, that may sound a little different as you hear it, but you're, you're listening to two Orthodox believers in terms of we believe in one God and one God only. We, we believe that Jesus is Lord. We believe in the authority and inspiration of the Scriptures. But, Michael, there are verses, Exodus 15, perhaps the most famous one, and it's chanted in the synagogue, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods. Mm -hmm. Adonai. What do they mean by that? Did the Israelites believe in, in many different gods? What did you learn from the ancient Near East, and then how does that come to bear on the Scriptures? Sure. Well, the, the Israelites would have believed in, in what I'll call multiple Elohim. There were many Elohim, uh, but they only assigned a certain set of attributes, uh, unique attributes, to one of those Elohim, which was uh, Hashem, again, the divine name, uh, the God of Israel. So this is easy to discern if you spend any time looking at Elohim, either paper sources or software. The biblical writers use the word Elohim, which most of your audience probably knows is one of the more common words. Uh, it gets translated capital G-O-D, God. It's used as a proper name in many cases. But they also use Elohim to speak of the gods of other nations. Uh, there's First Samuel 28, when Samuel is, you know, brought up from from the, the grave, the, the, the seer says, I, I see an Elohim coming up out of the earth. And it, you know, the, the narrative tells us, you know, that it's Samuel because he speaks the word of God and he curses Saul and it comes to pass and all this kind of thing. Psalm 82 is sort of a classic. You know, God has taken his place in the Ba'adat El, in the divine council, divine assembly. Elohim there, singular, because the, the verbal uh, there, the participle is singular. But then the rest of the verse says, in the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. Mm. And the passage goes on to describe, again, this heavenly assembly. And so there's plural Elohim there. The point is that the biblical writer uses this word, Elohim, to speak of a, of a range of unseen beings, a range of spiritual beings. But one of those beings and the God of Israel, is also distinguished, is also what I call species unique. He is separated out by virtue of attributes. There are passages where he gets credited with creating all the beings in the unseen world. He gets credited with being the creator, with being the sovereign. 
so on and so forth, and in control of all things. And so if you asked an Israelite, hey, what do you believe is over there on the other side in the unseen world? And he would say, well, there's lots of Elohim, and Yahweh is an Elohim, and the God of Israel is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is him. Mm -hmm. There is a species uniqueness to it. But the problem is, is we look at the word G-O-D, especially if it's capitalized in English, and we just sort of mentally assign a set of attributes to the word, as opposed to looking at how the word's used. And so, you know, when you run around talking about, hey, there's there's multiple Elohim and, and passages like Exodus 15, who is like you among the gods? Well, those, those gods to an Israelite were real, but they were inferior. They were lesser mm-hmm. by definition. If I want to use fancy academic language, they were ontologically inferior to an Israelite. But even saying that kind of troubles, you know, people because we're used to thinking of the gods as though they're, they're vapor, that they're not real. Uh, well, the, the Exodus 15 doesn't say, oh, you know, Lord, who is like you among the cartoon characters that we know really aren't real? Wink, wink. I mean, you're, you're, you're comparing the Lord to something that isn't real? Well, how, how does that show his superiority? I mean, how do, you know, All right, so, we don't so, really so assign who, any, any validity to them. So how, who, do, how is he glorified in that? Who were they then? Were they, were they demons? Were they angels? Were they... It's it's clear the scripture speaks of these other beings. It's clear that that's, that scripture speaks of only one being the the God in the sense that we would use it the absolute creator, the the first cause of everything else, the uncreated one. So who are these other beings in the divine council? Well, it, <clears throat> the, there, there's a terminological gap here because on the one hand, Elohim is not a word that is about attributes. It's a what I call a place of residence term. If if I call you an Elohim, it means you live over in the spiritual realm. You are okay. you are a resident of the disembodied realm. That's why the departed Samuel can be referred to as an Elohim because he's disembodied. He's no longer you know on the human plane and so on and so forth. So it, it's a word that assigned you to a realm. So in that respect, any being angel, demon, whatever, because they are a denizen, an inhabitant of that realm, is an Elohim. But the, as far as demons go, that is a, a sort of different critter. It, it, it's another term that's used to describe sort of a function. Shadim is, is typically a, a guardian-type term in the ancient Near East, and so it's, it's a functional kind of term same for angel right. so I'm, I'm going to jump in here and we're gonna we're gonna get into a an area of controversy that michael's actually written on spoken on where the ancient beings maybe there's a connection between them and aliens and paranormal Welcome back to The Line of Fire. My guest is a biblical and Semitic scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser, and he is academic editor for Logo Software. In fact, I'll tell you about our partnership in a moment. But somehow in the studies that he's done and the things that he's looked into, he's intersected with some myths and some popular beliefs out there. Joey, play clip number one. The ancient Sumerian text... Uh, just in a very broad overview, basically tell us that more than 400,000 years ago that these Anunnaki came from space and landed on the earth in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. They uh, began to set up a colony that they called Eden. Oh, okay. Uh, (laughs) Michael, are you still there? You didn't get abducted during the break, did you? No, I did not. Uh, okay, you mentioned earlier in the show that you always had an interest in kind of old, weird things. Now now you get into the world of the Old Testament and the ancient Near East and these languages, and, and of course there are myths from there, but, but there are folks, I guess you see it on the History Channel or whatever it is, and they're talking about ancient aliens and the paranormal and the Nephilim. You, you've actually intersected with this world in some of your research and then you're you're on secular radio talking about these things so would, would you take about three or four minutes and enlighten us as to your interaction with this and separate some some myth from from fact here sure yeah i i, I 
got sort of dragged into, into this, but I have to own some of the issue. It, it began uh, by me avoiding the first year of what should have been my dissertation. Uh, I decided to take a year off and write a novel, which turned out to be The Facade, which really dealt with two questions. One was, if there was a genuine extraterrestrial disclosure or reality, how would that impact uh, the Bible believer, the Judeo-Christian uh, person you know, who held a high view of Scripture? How, what would that so do if there's really faith? life on other planets, is the Bible true? Right. Does that change the gospel? So on. Exactly, okay. exactly. How does, what, what kind of ripple effect will that have? And then the second question is, well, what if, what if we thought was a disclosure was actually something much worse? And so that got me into, again, in, in the course of the fiction, the divine council, the unseen world, and all this kind of stuff. But when I wrote that, I wound up through a real odd set of circumstances, uh, being on Coast to Coast AM, which I, I knew that show well. It used to be Art Bell as the host. And, and after I appeared on that show, I started to get you know challenges about this ancient astronaut stuff, which, which of course I was familiar with, but that wasn't the point of the book, but it sort of drew me in, and I sort of evolved into this sort of friendly you know, Christian debunker of ancient alien nonsense. And what I, what I try to do is take people back to the primary text. Like the clip that you played, my first question would be, show me the tablets, uh -huh. show me the text that make this connection, the Anunnaki coming from space, from this, you know, this space travel, the whole bit. Exactly what you described, show me that in the text. And that usually kills the discussion right there. But because I, I do that, and I've sort of become known for that, um, again, I've, I've been drawn into this world, and I'm, I'm happy to be there, because people who are thinking about extraterrestrials and ancient aliens and these sorts of things, I have found, are very predisposed to thinking about spiritual things, thinking about mm. very big picture things. Who are we? How did we get here? Is there a God? How do we understand that God? What's the purpose in my life? You know, or is the divine world really this other world? I mean, they're very predisposed to getting into really good spiritual discussions. And so I've I found it a, a very uh, worthwhile thing to do, uh, because frankly, for many people in that in that realm, in that uh, sort of realm of discussion, it's an all or nothing proposition. They're either saying the Bible is just junk and, and this is reality or they've had some experience and they're trying to process it. Lots of Christians have had, you know, sort of really odd experiences and they're they're trying to well, should I jettison my faith or how do I factor this into my faith? What do I do? And you get all sorts of reactions and responses and and attempts to, you know, either get rid of it or, you know, turn around and hate it or try to keep it in some way. And so there there's a lot of real fruitful turf here uh that I, I've found is is worth treading on and, and being involved with. Fascinating. So you've got people who recognize there's more than just this world, who are on some type of spiritual exploration. It seems many of them have certain new age mentalities in common. And mm -hmm. rather than denying the existence of a su supernatural realm, we're, we're just going to tell them the truth of it, basically. Yeah, you, you get a, it's a mixed bag, you know, with people who are into this. Some of them really try to process it all in terms of philosophical materialism. There is no supernatural world, and that's mm -hmm. the way they're using the word. But others will say, well, now hold on a minute. And this is your classic New Age crowd, that even if there's a, a natural sort of element or explanation or bridge, it still transcends what we think of as a reality. And, and you, you, you can address people in both of those categories in different ways, but the fact is, is that they like to talk about it, uh, and, and so it, it, it's just a, a natural sort of segue to get into uh, spiritual things and really confront them with, well, what you're saying about the Bible or this or that passage is really a caricature. Maybe some church taught you this, but this isn't really what the text says, and if it's not what the text says, you need to rethink what you're doing with it or how you're reacting to it. And, and, and because you can actually go back to the text and say, hey, look, I've studied these Sumerian tablets, and I, I've looked at the hieroglyphs, and that gives you a certain street cred with these people who have so much bogus history and information. All right, I, I want to get into some 
fascinating insights, how, how Scripture opens up. Ask Michael to give us some examples of how, how Scripture opens up when you understand Hebrew here, when you understand the Near Eastern background. Michael, perhaps you could give us a, an idea of what you actually do at Logos and why, why it's of such interest to, to the non-scholars out there. Sure. I, I, I do a number of things or have done a number of things. It, it, things just sort of tend to you know, ebb and flow here and change ad hoc. But examples would be I, I helped create some reverse interlinears. I'm the person who did the King James reverse interlinear, and that's in a task that involved hand-linking every word of the translation with every word or syllable uh, of the original text so that you can start with English and with a right click do searches on the original language even if you don't know it so there's Whoa. tools like that that's that's Go quite ahead. a project oh it is it took me a year i mean i did both both testaments um wow. i sort of felt like i owed it to the king james i i, I kind of grew up on it and same here uh, i'm probably the only person in the world who's had who's done a task like that and gone really word for word syllable for syllable through the text like that but it, again, that's just an example of the kind of thing that, that I've worked on. I, I supervised, uh, which is a real fancy word for saying I herded cats with PhDs, but I, I super, supervised a team of scholars to do our Septuagint interlinear project, You know, trying to keep them on task. Uh, more recently, I'm involved in uh, what we're calling Lagos Mobile Education, where we're trying to produce seminary-level content in terms of instruction, not just creating a software tool to find information, but getting actual instruction uh, uh, in all sorts of areas that you would encounter in seminary. So we have professors come in, we help them prep their material to go into a video studio, and we film them in a very specific way uh, to do that. And then we take the video, that's just the starting point, we take the video and sort of embed it into the software and create links in both directions to the, the video content and then outward, creating screencasts so that people can see how the software is useful for evaluating what a speaker says or where how a speaker reached a particular conclusion, that sort of thing. So I'm, I've really been heavily involved in mobile ed for the last two years, and we actually just launched that. But um, I'm, I'm also sort of the wacky filter here where that might sound strange given the subject matter of the discussion, but uh -huh. we get things sent to us all the time. You know, is this worth publishing? Is this project worth pursuing? Is this data good or not? And so if it concerns original language stuff, I'll, I'll be part of that conversation. So I, I do lots of different things um, for, for the company, but they usually revolve around vetting content or creating some sort of uh, original language resource. And, and then this way again... We, we had the joy and privilege of investing X number of years in our lives studying the original sources, text, going back to the ancient languages. And, of course, we continue to, to work in those as part of our, our academic field and, and teaching and study. But what you're helping people to do is someone that, man, I just want to dig more into the word. But where do I go? And there's so many things out there, and they're all claiming mm -hmm. to be right and accurate and so on. Well, here using Logos Bible software, someone loads the King James, okay, they can use that as their primary translation, and, and on every word, they can do a right click, and it'll take them into a Hebrew word or a Greek word, and then they can click on there and, and go to dictionaries that, that are accurate with their information, or, or it goes on and on from there. So if you want to find out about this and our partnership with Logos, Go to AskDrBrown.org. Just go to my website right on the homepage. Click on the Logos Bible Software logo and dive in today. Well, my special guest, Dr. Michael Heiser, academic editor of Logos Bible Software, Hebrew, Semitic, biblical scholar, who's also refuted some of the paranormal myths out there. In fact, it, Joey, there's someone trying to push through with interrupted broadcast with a question. I, I, can you hear it right now? The search for humanity's first possible contact with alien beings in prehistoric times leads to an unlikely place, to the Bible's earliest chapters, to the book of Genesis. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Genesis 6, 4. Uh, 
Okay. <laughs> now, Mike, I, I promised you we wouldn't major on, on that, but someone called me one time and they said, have you heard so-and-so's teaching on the Nephilim? And I said, no. And they said, well, I mean, I knew all the ancient stuff, but that the Nephilim are actually the aliens that are abducting people. It's like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. But, but I guess you've, you've heard that before. Tell me about Genesis 6. What's actually going on there? Give me some Hebrew, ancient, and Eastern insights to the text. Well, I'll start here by by telling you the the view I reject, and that's the the majority view within the church, and that that is the idea that the sons of God are the line of Seth. Yeah, I'm with you on that. The the daughters of of, of men are you know the line of Cain. I mean, there are all sorts of problems with that, and people have dealt with that before. But so let's throw that one aside. I think there's basically two ways. Uh, to look at this. The the easiest way, in, in some respects, is just to take it for what it says. We have divine beings coming to earth. They assume flesh, and flesh does what flesh can do. I mean, we have other examples in the Old Testament where uh, the God of Israel himself and angels sit down and they eat. They have a meal. You know, that we have examples where two of them grab you know, lot and pull him into the house. In other words, there's this tactile, corporeal uh, essence, you know, to to certain appearances like this. So flesh does what flesh can do, so on and so forth. And then that's what we have in in Genesis six. Again, it, it's bizarre, it, but but it, it's the plainest reading of the text. And the offspring, of course, would be these Nephilim. That's the way that everybody on the Jewish side and on the Christian side took the passage until just before the time of Augustine, so the late 300s A.D. Everybody was there. Uh, and so I, I think that is indicative in, in and of itself, you know, that yep. with, when Augustine came along, he decided to change this. Personally, I think it's because of Augustine's own bad experience with the Manichees, again, a Christian sect that he was part of early on in his spiritual journey, and he they held the Book of Enoch in high reverence. And when he split from them, he pretty much washed his hands of the whole bit. So that's Augustine. But the other way I think you could take this is the biblical writer may be trying to make a a theological point without being literalistic, and that is there was an assumption, as Israelites were the offspring, the spawn of God, not in a literal sense, but he started off the Israelites with a supernatural intervention between Abraham and Sarah, and they became his sons and daughters, God's sons and daughters. So the assumption was that the inhabitants of Canaan that had to be removed were also the spawn of other gods. And that really is sort of a a fallout, if you will, from Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, what I call the Deuteronomy 32 worldview that the Israelites had, that uh, there was at Babel, when God divides up the nations, Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, again, reading that with the Dead Sea Scrolls and with the Septuagint, says that he divided them up the nations up among the sons of God. Mm-hmm. So if God is forsaking. I, I call it the Romans 1 event of the Old Testament. You won't obey me now after the flood. I gave you a really clear command. I gave you the reiterated the covenant. You still won't listen, so fine. You don't want me to be your God. You're going to get what you wish. I'm going to divide the nations up. I'm going to dis- disinherit you. I'm going to put you under the authority of lesser divine beings that are part of my council. Of course, it turns out badly because they become corrupt in Psalm 82. We we learn about that. And now I'm going to go over here in chapter 12, right after Babel, and I'm going to start over. I'm going to call my own person out here, and I'm going to supernaturally create a people from him. And those people, Israel, will be my portion, my inheritance. And the rest of the Old Testament is that nation, Israel, against the other nations, and the God of Israel against the other gods. And we have this spiritual cosmic combat. It plays out with cosmic geography in the Old Testament, you know, the, the sense that Israel is divine turf and everywhere else is, there's something icky about that. And it, it just plays out in all sorts of ways theologically. And, and it goes, it harkens back to Genesis 6 in that sense, because, again, it shows this consciousness that that if you weren't part of Israel, if you weren't part of God's lineage, if you weren't part of God's people, even before there was an Israel, then there's this idea that you have your sort of origin in some other some other way. So there's really two views. Again, the, the, the first view I said, the, the more literal view, is the way that everybody took it. Um, 
you know, and I don't have any problem with that because I'm not an anti-supernaturalist. If, if, if this is, if you have divine beings who can manifest in real flesh, well then, you know, who am I to say something like this couldn't happen? But again, there's a more theological way to look at it too. And so I, I kind of track on both. I'm interested in both. But when you get into the, the weird world of the paranormal, they'll look at Genesis 6 and like, yeah, you can read Genesis 6 through the filter of your alien belief system or this this thing that gets popularly called alien abduction. And you can sort of create this mirror, uh, again, this lens through which, you know, to look at this. And, and lots of people do. And then they start extrapolating all in, in all sorts of weird uh, ways and, you know, go down different roads with it. Uh, really, people in that, of that belief system are sort of just using it to direct people away from the theology of the Bible, trying to get to, to get them to gravitate toward really what is an alternative worldview. Mm-hmm. And, and one where there's no God to whom there's accountability or no dealing with sin. Right. Well, Yahweh question... is just another extraterrestrial. It's all, right. and th- these are natural beings, the product of evolution, blah, 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 blah. You know, and so on down the chain we go. Right. And one question, though, if, if we hold to Genesis 6 and, and speak of this intermingling of, of divine beings with, with human beings, wouldn't they all have been wiped out with the flood anyway, since God reconstitute the, reconstitutes the human race with, with Noah and his wife and the three sons and, and their, uh, their wives? It's actually a really old uh, question and a really old quandary. There are a number of ways you you can take that. If you if you hold to the global flood, then again the the, the problem is kind of kind of obvious. Uh, there's one one or two rabbinical texts that actually answer that question with Noah being a giant. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, again that, that that was their solution to it. Uh, you could take the grammar of the verse as saying you know that the the, the the sons of God you know and the daughters of men and and there's this phrase and also after that. And so you could, right. you could, you could legitimately translate that, uh, the following phrase as that we had Nephilim and, you know, men of renown on the earth when, or whenever, you know, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, sort of, sort of this idea that it, it happened after the flood again, because you have this connection with numbers 13, with the, the Anakim who are related right. to the, to the Nephilim and so on and so forth. If you take a local flood view, then what you have is you have the, the the spawn the Nephilim spawn living either outside of the area of the ancient Near East and again this I don't think this is proof of that but it's kind of interesting that some of these people in Scripture the Rephaim that get related to the Kaftorim these are part of the Sea Peoples the Philistines are descendants of that and of course we know the the, the giants they are viewed as coming from across the sea in you know in the Aegean and so you know you might have a, some sort of peripheral point to argue a local flood view there and how we get you know some of these beings in the in, in Canaan after the flood i mean ultimately who knows i mean there there is there are a number of different directions to go with that question and uh, you, you go all the way back to the ancient material and they're again they're coming up with any of those you know explanations and others to to try to answer it yeah, so again, it's it's interesting, it's fascinating. It could explain some of the texts where the Israelites were commanded to wipe these peoples out. But well, the I should bottom... say something about that. It, it, it's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, real, real quick, we've got about 30 seconds. Okay. Go ahead. If you overlay the people, the, the, the specific places that Joshua puts on their harem, okay, the ban, yeah. devote to destruction, and then you look at the terminology for the giant clans, there's actually an overlay there. There are population centers in the in the Kherem places of those particular people groups. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, it, it is. It, it's very interesting. What What is bottom line, though, is that there are textual, rational, biblical, ancient Near Eastern, and supernatural explanations that have nothing, nothing, nothing to do with with alien invasions, abductions, or anything like that. So when you really know the text, you don't get involved in this mythology, which takes you away from the one true God. Thank you so much for being part of the broadcast. 
Michael Brown here with my special guest, Dr. Michael Heiser, academic editor with Logos Bible Software, PhD in Hebrew Bible and Semitic languages, a biblical language and Bible scholar. Back to uh, Dr. Heiser. Michael, give me an example of something that's come alive for you studying the Bible in Hebrew, studying the ancient Semitic languages. Give, give us a couple of nuggets. We've only got about five minutes left, but some things where, where you just get an, an, an audience interested if they dig a little deeper, what's actually there? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, the, I think in general, just the, the cosmic narrative and the interconnectivity of the scriptures in their entirety it has really been eye-opening to me. I'll give you a specific example. Acts 2 is very familiar. Day of Pentecost, you have uh, Jews from all mm-hmm. over uh, the Mediterranean uh, in Jerusalem to celebrate. And, you know, we, we sort of read that, and okay, I know, you know, that they get converted and Peter preaches to them, and then they go back home and they spread the gospel. Okay, that all of that's true. But if you set that against the backdrop, and there are clues in the text again that actually link back to certain Septuagint passages, Greek translation of the Old Testament that is being used in that sermon, you see a progressive recapturing, a progressive re-inheriting of the disinherited nations from Deuteronomy 32 and Genesis 11. It's really dramatic. It actually goes in a coherent direction from east to west, really? where the Jewish presence was, and goes all end of the known world, which in the Table of Nations is Tarshish, okay? And then if you actually go through the Book of Acts, where does, where does the story end? It ends in Rome, but Paul actually says in two of his letters, he has this blinding ambition to get to Spain. And if you again, you do a little research in the ancient world, Spain was Tarshish. Paul mm-hmm. had this sense that the purpose of his life as the apostle to the Gentile was to progressively take back that which had been disinherited. In other words, it was God's program not just to win the Jew and not just to win the occasional Gentile, but it goes all the way back to Isaiah 66. I will have every nation... I will reclaim what is rightfully mine, not only in a, in a sort of general gospel sense, but the gospel is the key, but also it's a combat idea. I am going to conquer this turf through the gospel that is under the domain of these lesser beings that I put over them, and they rebelled against me and became corrupt. I will win back every inch of this planet. So it's this progressive going back you know, and, and, and redoing, again, what happened in great antiquity. And, and the Bible is actually full of that kind of thing. Really, mm-hmm. under the surface, you know, again, this, this, we talk about spiritual warfare, and we sort of make it cartoonish, but spiritual warfare has a lot of biblical theology attached to it. People, places, things. Jesus goes to a particular place and says a particular thing. And when you reference that against the Old Testament, against this Deuteronomy 32 worldview, sometimes you come away with a real punch in the nose, I mean, to, to the gods. I mean, it, I mean, Jesus is just sort of laying down the gauntlet. I'm here, let's go at it. You know, that, that sort of thing. And, and really laying out why he's here, how he's going to you know, achieve victory you know, in this place over this. You know, yeah. the, anyone that, that controls this, there's just all sorts of things like that. And so just in a general sense, that has just been really eye-opening, mm. uh, that that Scripture is just full of combat theology. Yeah, and, know, and you know, so against the other. So, folks, understand us rightly. Again, we're, we're talking in spiritual terms, but it reminds mm-hmm. me of I was coming home from from New York City from NYU one day in my studies, and the the Long Island Railroad train was so crowded I couldn't even reach down and get my briefcase. So I just started meditating on Scripture, and and I was meditating on the longer end of Mark's gospel, and you'll drive out demons, so of course the Greek ekbalo, and I thought, ekbalo, how was ekbalo used in the Septuagint, in the, the Greek translation mm-hmm. of the Hebrew scripture? I said, wait, wait, that's driving out the Canaanites, and then you start to see the, the parallels, you know, they drove out the Canaanites, we drive out demons, or also for ligares to dispossess. Right? Yeah, and, and if you uh, connect that, again, with what's a demon? Well, in Jewish theology, you know, 
mostly outside the Old Testament. When you killed one of the Nephilim descendants, they were disembodied, and then Enoch says those are the demons that are sent to roam the earth to harass humankind. So I mean, when, when you start getting deeper. into stuff like that, <laughs> it just, I mean, you get all these overlays, and it just, it just makes sense. Right. Out, and, out and of then, these seemingly random things you see in the text. And, and some of it, I'm sure the writers saw, you know, Paul gets an insight by divine revelation or, or Yeshua opens up his disciples' minds sure. to certain things. But some of it must have been God and his, God and his wisdom directed people to certain texts. And then we keep studying oh, sure. and digging. Listen, my, I'm disappointed that we're out of time, but God willing, <laughs> I'm getting involved in, in the mobile uh, software program. I've been in touch with your team there. And if I, oh, if I get out, if I get out your way, we can have a conversation without radio constraints. But thanks for the phenomenal work you're doing and devoting your gifts and talents to, to advance the gospel in such an important, practical way. And by the way, just one little last serendipitous thing, the, the, uh, the resource, the audio resource that I was offering to our listeners this week is 24 hours of teaching I did years ago on spiritual warfare and angels, demons, and deliverance. So there, there you <laughs> there have you it. It all, come, it all comes together. Hey, thanks again for your time and appreciate working together with Logos. Well, thank, thanks for having me on your show and also for your partnership.